Hi there everyone. Today we're talking about objects at the Royal Society, including monsters and human skeletons and all sorts of incredible things. And now that I have your attention, the real story is you haven't got them anymore, have you Keith? Ah, uh, no. Ah, uh, sorry. So this video is all about stuff the Royal Society used to have. And it's all catalogued in these books and manuscripts behind us here, isn't it Keith? Yeah, we know exactly what we used to have. Uh, even though we don't have it anymore. Uh, and that's rather thanks to a guy called Nehemiah Gru, who was a curator at the Royal Society with Robert Hooke, who we know as Curator of Experiments. Gru was a museum curator from 1677, and he produced this magnificent volume here, all about objects held in the Royal Society repository. So this is like one of your like predecessors. Uh, kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't have a proper museum anymore, but yeah, he's, he's uh, kind of 17th century Keith. All right, I like the sound of him already. So here we have the title page. So this is the rarities belonging to the Royal Society and preserved at Gresham College. Look at um, that, James. We always have trouble deciding what to call our videos. At last we know, rarities <laughs> of the Royal Society. Yeah, so, sometimes natural, sometimes artificial. All right. And who's the portrait of there? So this is Daniel Colwell, who was the treasurer of the Royal Society. And he made a donation which really got the museum going. Therefore, when Gru produced this catalogue, he dedicated it to Daniel Colwell. Look at that. Yeah. Comparative anatomy of stomachs and guts. Maybe that's our title, James. <laughs> we got to too many options. <laughs> I'm excited. Let's get in. Well, well Gru, was, Gru was great. I mean, he, he did do dissections and we'll see some of them. He was a great plan specialist as well. But we can see here his dedication to his honoured friend, Daniel Colwell, fellow of the Royal Society. He's really sucking up to Colwell, isn't he? Yep, yep. He was the treasurer. He had the cash. Right. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so the rarities are divided into various parts. It begins with natural rarities, and this is part one of animals. And we have some human rarities there. What's the first thing you'd want to see in a museum? An Egyptian mummy. The, Straight there. The very first words, an Egyptian mummy. Now you're talking. Of course, we have had Egyptian mummies on objectivity already, real ones. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. But well, was it ours? It wasn't yours. No. And you haven't got one anymore, so. No, no, yeah. no. I would have done yours if you still had one. I doubt you. <laughs> Given by the illustrious Prince Henry, Duke of Norfolk, it is an entire one taken out of the Royal Pyramids mm. in length five feet and a half. Imagine that if we went down into the vaults one day and you just pulled over one of those big cupboards and said, oh, by the way, Brady, did I show you this five and a half foot mummy? <laughs> yeah, that would be good. <laughs> so they collected human body parts, of yeah. course, as yeah. well, which yeah. for the time was, was uh, accepted. Yep. Uh, these days, of course, far more questionable. And we have a leg of a dodo. A leg of a dodo. Imagine the objectivity video. I know what you're going to say. We've done one, Keith. You've, you've done a dodo. We've done a dodo. You've done a dodo. Done a dodo. I not knew it. yours. Not yours. No, no. <laughs> That would have been good though, wouldn't it? Largely described in Willoughby's ornithology. Yeah. More especially distinguished from other birds by the membranous hood on his head. It says here, the leg it seems of a certain monstrous bird, tis half a foot long. Wow. I wonder what that would have been. Mm, but let's move on, because I mean, there's, there's more. Fish. 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 We know the Royal Society loves fish. Mm. All sorts. All kinds, all kinds of fishes. Two naked shrimps. <laughs> That's a bit racy, Brady, isn't it, really? Well, you know, back in those days, it was all right to display naked shrimps. These days, it's yeah, a different yeah, time. Yeah. Okay. This stuff would have all been dried out and in boxes, and like, what would it even look like? Well, it, well, museums and repositories were, were different at this period. I mean, we're, we're quite used today of seeing things behind glass in exhibition cases. But this would have been in, in cabinets. You could, you could handle specimens if you'd been invited to the Royal Society. These objects were there to, to add to the knowledge of the fellows so they could use them as they did and try to understand the natural world. This would be in Gresham College to begin with and they eventually moved the repository into Grain Court by which time uh, they had to employ an architect to inspect the floor loadings because they had so much material. Yeah. Uh, they, they thought the floors were going to collapse in there. But when they eventually moved to Somerset House, they decided they didn't have room for it. And that's the point where they handed it over to the what became the British Museum. 
museum. I'm yeah. seeing things like stalactites and crystals and that sort of stuff. I imagine a lot of this stuff is still in the museum collection hidden away somewhere. You would hope so, but you know, the descriptions are difficult to identify. If you had to identify a green talc spar, the whole piece here is a rude figure, easily broken into rhomboid plates, how would you know one talc spar specimen from another? Yeah. How would you know the one that was in the Royal Society? Yeah. And we know that lots of labels were lost along the way. There is one way you could do it, uh, and some scholars have done this. If a specimen is illustrated somewhere in the philosophical transactions, as, as some of them were, or in other books, that's when you can compare the illustration to the original specimen, or what you think is the original specimen, and maybe you would just identify some things that way. Speaking of pictures, here at the back, there's some real goodies. Look at that. Oh, I can see the smile on James's face as he saw those. This is pictures of some of the stuff that's in there, obviously, Keith. Yeah. That's right. So this is a stone uh, voided by a man. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's bladderstone. Right. Okay. That's Stone. nice. Next to an armadillo. I hope the armadillo wasn't voided by a man. No, no, <laughs> right. absolutely not. So the tusk of a wild boar there. Oh, look at all of that. Think of the objectivity videos you'd have here, Brady. Skin of the buttock of a rhinoceros. Essential for your museum, I'd say. Oh, this is good stuff. This is my favourite, actually. This is a crocodile skeleton. Look at that. Nice. Ah, oh, imagine if you still had that here, up on one of the walls, Keith. You'd love that. I'd, I'd love that. They had a whale skeleton as well. No. Did, yeah, yeah. Some of those fish. Yeah, yeah. Like a fish, some starfish. Yeah. Oh, this is good, good stuff. Snail shells. All right, enough of the shells. They've gone a bit overboard with oh, the you, shells. You, you can't have too many shells. Oh, insects, very good. Nah, it's more like it. Beetles. Coconut? Coconut, yeah. yeah. Sponges. Sponges and corals. Oh, wow. Oh, here we go. Crystals. Mm -hmm. You're talking about those spars and crystals. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Nice. Oh, uh, guts. There's the guts at last. We promised you stomachs and guts. The guts of a weasel, mm -hmm. the guts of a polecat, the guts of a cat, and the guts of a fox. And more guts, mm -hmm. <laughs> more stomachs and guts. We have rabbits, a rat. Whoa, that's a horse, stomach and guts. Big guts. They loved their stomachs and guts, didn't mm. they? A cassowary and an owl and the stomachs and guts of a salmon. I did not think that we would be looking at so many pictures of stomachs and guts today. But. Yeah, yeah. Gru's catalog is of the 1680s, but of course the Royal Society's repository continued after that, right, right throughout the 18th century. And the catalogues continued. So they uh, produced manuscript catalogues of what the Royal Society held in its collections. Here's a conserved one. So this is some of the things that they'd collected and you can see up to the 1660s here, but then it continues onwards in some cases. So this is habits, this is costume. Keith, this doesn't seem very scientific. So they were trying to collect everything from the natural world and all human productions, partly because they were interested in manufactures, uh, arts, what was happening in other parts of the world, how did they do things, they were interested in everything. You can see exactly here, this is some of that material, so this is 1671. Oh, it says habits and weapons here. Habits, yeah. An Indian bow and quiver containing arrows, diversely headed, presented by Mr. Owen Lundberg from Mr. Winthrop, Mr. Winthrop is in New England. So this is the New America's colonies we're talking about here. All right. So this one is quite interesting because this literally uses Gru's catalogue. It says human rarity. So again, it begins as Gru's catalogue does. But here we have an instance where Gru's printed catalogue has been cut up and added to. So this is literally a cut and paste job. So here's some of what they're wanting to add to it as the collection expands. And this is, as we can see here, there's lots more stuff being added all mm -hmm. the time. Before, sadly, it was all yep. dispersed to museums or thrown away. Exactly right, or lost or pinched or whatever else happened to it uh, uh, during its history. You have got one last little finale for us, Keith. Well, well it is. This is Daniel Colwell, the guy who started it all. So the this, money man. The money man. All right. So this is the one who Gru's repository catalogue is dedicated to and we know that this painting did hang in the repository at Crane Court. So this at least 
is one item from the repository. Possibly the last remaining item that survives from this famous collection. Oh, there'll be more, just scholars need to really go out there and find them. So we can make an objectivity video about all this stuff. Now before we finish, Keith, one of my favourite things to do is to look at the back of paintings. Okay. And this is an opportunity for us to look at the back of a painting. I love back saying, of a painting? I just love seeing what's on the back. Let's have a look. Oh, that is nice. That's a real, like, interesting little uh, piece of hodgepodgery, I would call that. Mm. Nice They're always thing. dustier on the back than they are on the front, that's for sure. It's well done, though. I like that. Mm. That's got real character. Love it. So, all the objectivity films that might have been. I know, if only we were making YouTube videos back in the, what was this, 1600s? Yeah, that's <laughs> right, yep. 1680s, that, that, that would have been great. That, what a collection. That was the time you wanted to be making YouTube videos. Yeah, with Daniel Cole. Yeah, well, he could have funded it. He could. Yeah. This video was brought to you by Daniel Cole. <laughs> I know you're all really excited. This is probably one of the most <laughs> famous museum objects in the UK, maybe even the world. I'm uh, yeah, I'd say top 10, definitely. Top 10. Can I at least carry the box? Yes, you can, yeah. This is amazing. I dare not even open the box, Mark. You do the honours for us. So in these two boxes here, we have the only dodo soft tissue anywhere in the world. In here, we have a skull with the skin on the other side. This is the skin that's been removed from that side of the skull. So there. that skin came off that side of the yeah. skull? Yeah, so that was removed to have a look inside 